on World News Tonight. Economic crisis. Eurozone inflation hits a new record high since the creation of the euro as the war in Ukraine fuels the crisis. Grieving Uvalde. Grief and anger in USA rise as the first funerals for the victims were commenced. Historic accord. Israel agrees to landmark free trade deal with UAE to strengthen links between the two nations. And Jubilee celebration. The countdown begins for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee as the preparations ramp up. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on the World News Tonight. Our top stories today is it's still on the escalating war in Ukraine. The Ukrainian army is determined to slow down Russia's steady advance in the country's eastern Donbass region as Moscow concentrates its efforts on encircling the area. However, Ukraine said that Russia had taken control of most of the eastern industrial city of Severodonetsk. Ukrainian trucks, tankers and transporters carrying armored vehicles were on the move in the Donetsk region Tuesday, while the fiercest fighting was in neighboring Luhansk, where Ukraine said that Russia had taken control of most of the eastern industrial city of Siviero Donetsk, a bombed out wasteland whose capture Moscow had made a principal objective of its invasion. Western military analysts say Moscow had drained manpower and firepower from across other parts of the front to concentrate on the fight there. But Russia's all-out assault has been met by tough resistance from Ukrainian forces, and capturing the city has taken longer than Russia hoped, despite one of the biggest ground attacks of the three-month-long war. Ukraine says the unrelenting bombardment has destroyed all of the city's critical infrastructure, and thousands of residents remain trapped. To the north, in the ruined city of Kharkiv, rescuers on Tuesday searched the rubble for bodies. Ukrainian forces regained territory around Kharkiv, the nation's second largest city, and pushed back Russian troops weeks ago. Ukraine accuses Moscow of war crimes on a huge scale, flattening cities and killing and raping civilians. Russia denies the accusations. Ukrainian court finds two Russian soldiers guilty of war crimes. Captured soldiers sentenced to more than 11 years in jail each for shelling a civilian area in Ukraine's northeastern Kharkiv region. A Ukrainian court has sentenced two captured Russian soldiers to 11 and a half years in jail for shelling a town in eastern Ukraine. It is the second war crimes verdict since the start of Russia's invasion in February. Alexander Bobakin and Alexander Ivanov, who both pleaded guilty last week, listened to the verdict at the Kotolevska District Court in central Ukraine. The pair acknowledged being part of an artillery unit that fired Grad missiles at targets in the Kharkiv region from Russia's Belgorod. Prosecutors said the shelling destroyed an educational facility in the town of Derhachi, but caused no casualties. Bobakin and Ivanov, described as an artillery driver and a gunner, were captured after crossing the border and continuing the shelling. Prosecutors had asked for 12 years, but the defense asked for leniency, saying the soldiers had been following orders and repented. After the verdict, the two were asked if they felt the sentence was fair. Both said yes. On May 23rd, a Ukrainian court sentenced a Russian soldier to life in prison for killing an unarmed civilian. Kyiv has accused Russia of atrocities and brutality against civilians during the invasion and says it has identified more than 10,000 possible war crimes. Speaking in The Hague on Tuesday, Kyiv's top prosecutor Irina Venediktova said hundreds of individual suspects had also been identified. We have more than 600 suspects. Actually, it is high level of top milita militaries, politicians and propaganda agents of Russian Federation. Uh, when we speak about war crimes in Ukraine, you know we have near 80 suspects, people whom we identify as a war criminals and started to prosecute them. Russia has denied targeting civilians or involvement in war crimes while it carries out what it calls a special military operation in Ukraine. Parents in Uvalde are facing a grim reality of beginning to lay their children to rest in a world that is not safe yet. And questions are growing about the 78 minutes of terror inside the school. 
Residents of Uvalde, Texas, began laying to rest the 21 children and teachers killed in last week's mass shooting. Grieving family members and friends entered a Catholic church on Tuesday for the funeral of 10-year-old Amory Jo Garza, who, according to an obituary, was sweet, sassy, funny, and who loved swimming and drawing. Maite Juliana Rodriguez, a 10-year-old honor student who loved whales and dolphins and who dreamed of becoming a marine biologist, was also laid to rest Tuesday. The young girls were killed along with 17 other students, all aged 9 to 11 and two teachers, by a gunman who burst into their fourth grade classroom and opened fire with a high-velocity AR-15 style semi-automatic rifle. While Uvalde grieves, President Joe Biden on Tuesday said he planned to meet with lawmakers in Congress about guns. Well, there's an awful lot of suffering. Speaking during a White House meeting with New Zealand's Prime Minister, Biden said much of the violence is preventable. I've, I've been to more mass shooting aftermaths than I think any president of American history, unfortunately. And it's, uh, it's just so much of it is, much of it is preventable. Many Democrats, including Biden, who traveled to Uvalde on Sunday to comfort the town, have called for more restrictions, including a ban on assault-style weapons and universal background checks. Republicans have successfully held off tougher gun laws. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. Look, the president has done everything that he can um, from, from, from the federal government. We are looking at other executive actions that we can possibly do, but it's not up to him alone. In Texas, the elementary school shooter was legally able to buy his weapon on his 18th birthday, a week before the massacre. He bought hundreds of rounds of ammunition and a second rifle in the days that followed. Eurozone inflation rose to yet another record high in May, challenging the European Central Bank view that gradual interest rate increases from July will be enough to tame stubbornly high price growth. There's fresh pain in store for shoppers after Eurozone inflation hit a new record high in May. It went up to 8.1% in the 19 countries sharing the euro, above April's 7.4% and over analyst projections. It comes as price growth spread across markets, which implied it was not just energy pulling up inflation anymore. Prices have gone up sharply over the last year due to supply chain issues and the conflict in Ukraine. May's number also challenged the European Central Bank's view that gradual interest rate rises from July would be enough to stop high price growth. Inflation is now four times the ECB's 2% target. Policymakers may now be more worried by the quick rise in underlying prices, meaning they could be here to stay. ECB President Christine Lagarde already flagged 25 basis points increases in the ECB's minus 0.5% deposit rate in July and September. But some economists fear this will not be enough, as underlying inflation shows no sign of calming. Central bank governors in Austria, the Netherlands and Latvia have all said that a 50 basis point rate hike in July should be on the table. The ECB is next due to meet on June 9th, when it is again expected to signal rate hikes. Now France's economy shrank unexpectedly as well in the first quarter as consumers struggled to cope with surging inflation. French consumers have been feeling the pinch. They are now being offered reductions on food products as well as detergent at lower prices. In this supermarket, customers are looking closely at promotions to fight the effects of high inflation. I'm looking at the promos. With everything going up, we're trying to do what we can. Food, cleaning products, hygiene products, a bit of everything. With the rise in prices, the share of promo items in the trolleys of consumers has gone up a consequence of concerns over the cost of living. This specialist in retail marketing says special offers have been increasing in recent weeks. All the major supermarkets today are trying to improve their market share on prices and promotions because they know it's that which will boost their overall market shares. Traditionally, these special offers have been reserved for the most expensive products, such as alcohol and electronic devices. But the strategy of supermarkets is changing. Many are applying discounts on food products or fuel. 
Three consumers in four now say they are ready to change their spending habits in the wake of these promotions. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Israel signed a free trade agreement with the United Arab Emirates. It's the first as an Arab state and which eliminates most tariffs and aims to lift their annual bilateral trade to more than $10 billion. Foreign minister tweeting in Arabic, the United Arab Emirates ambassador to Israel posting in Hebrew hailing what they call a historic trade deal that would bring growth, cooperation and bigger dreams. Since they normalized relations in 2020, trade was boosted. Now tariffs will be eliminated on 96 percent of goods, which is meant to bring growth to both countries and lower prices. Israel would export tech products, diamonds, fruit and vegetables. The UAE, construction material, aluminium, steel and jewelry. The target is an annual $10 billion of bilateral trade, far more than Israel's longtime Arab ally, Egypt. The real goal, though, is not bilateral trade, but using the UAE as a hub for thousands of Israeli companies hoping to reach markets in the larger region and across Asia. Historic as it may be, journalists were not able to cover the event. Initially invited, they were banned from attending. The signing comes at a time of heightened tensions between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. On Sunday, Israeli activists marched through Jerusalem and the UAE condemned what it called the storming of the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, also known as Temple Mount, the most sacred site in Judaism. Palestinians had criticized the normalization of ties with Israel, the UAE saying it hopes dialogue and trade will bring peace. Shanghai's roads, parks and shops hummed back to life today as the financial hub ended its strict anti-COVID lockdown for most of its 25 million residents after two long and trying months. People cheered in Shanghai's French concession in the early hours of Wednesday after the city finally released most of its 25 million residents from a strict lockdown at midnight. Some people gathered with friends they hadn't seen in person for two months, champagne in hand. Others wandered the streets just to be outside. As daylight came, Shanghai's streets, parks and shops hummed back to life. But for some, the allure of a return to normal quickly faded. China has gone against the global consensus that COVID-19 cannot be decisively defeated and has imposed a zero-tolerance policy to stamp out any outbreaks. During Shanghai's lockdown, many residents of the country's key financial and economic hub struggled to get food or medical care. Families were separated and hundreds of thousands were forced into centralized quarantine facilities. Despite criticisms that its zero-COVID policy is unsustainable, China is sticking fast to its goal of cutting off every infection chain at any cost. Life in Shanghai is not quite back to pre-COVID normal. Residents now have to test every 72 hours to take public transport and enter public venues. And those who test positive for COVID-19 and their close contacts still face difficult quarantines. Millions of people face severe hunger in the Horn of Africa as the worst drought in more than 40 years could extend to a fifth consecutive failed rainy season. The United Nations and the humanitarian agencies have warned. Across East Africa, suffering its worst drought in four decades, millions are in need of rain. But on Tuesday, the United Nations and humanitarian agencies warned that such prayers may well go unanswered. Four consecutive rainy seasons have failed, they said in a joint statement, with the March to May season appearing to be the driest on record. That's exacerbating a hunger crisis that could see 20 million people facing acute food insecurity by September. Forecasts also indicate the statement said that there is a concrete risk that a fifth rainy season from October to December will also fail. 
Claire Nullis, spokesperson for the World Meteorological Organization, told a briefing in Geneva that the threat of starvation looms in East Africa. We are particularly concerned that the situation is set to get worse, she said. Millions of livestock have died in Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia, according to the statement. And over a million people have been displaced in Somalia and southern Ethiopia. Aid agencies are seeking to avoid the repeat of a famine a decade ago that killed hundreds of thousands of people. The statement said a rapid scaling up of actions is needed now to save lives and avert starvation and death. The bodies of 22 people, including four Indians killed in the plane crash in Nepal's mountainous Mustang district, have been brought to Kathmandu, where the mortal remains would be handed over to their families after the post-mortem. Nepali search and rescue teams have recovered the remains of 22 people killed in a plane crash in the Himalayas. The flight's voice recorder was also recovered on Tuesday. The Twin Otter aircraft crashed on Sunday morning after taking off from the tourist town of Pokhara, 80 miles west of Kathmandu. The plane was bound for Jumsum, a popular tourist and pilgrimage site, on what should have been a 20-minute flight. Two Germans, four Indians and 16 Nepalese were on board. Soldiers and rescue workers retrieved the bodies from the wreckage, strewn across a steep slope at an altitude of around 14,500 feet. A spokesperson for the Civil Aviation Authority of Nepal said 10 bodies were brought to Kathmandu on Monday, while the remaining 12 will be flown into the capital on Tuesday and released to families following autopsies and identification. Operated privately by Tara Air, the plane is believed to have made its first flight in April 1979. The Nepali government has set up a five-member panel to determine the cause of the crash and suggest preventative measures for the aviation sector. Nepal, home to eight of the world's 14 highest mountains, including Mount Everest, has a history of air accidents. Its weather can change suddenly and airstrips are typically located in mountainous areas that are hard to reach. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. A cold snap has brought strong winds and icy conditions to parts of Australia over the past few days, with schools shut down and state emergency services responding to over a thousand calls for help. Britain will mark Queen Elizabeth's record-breaking 70 years on the throne this week with four days of celebration. Final preparations were underway ahead of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Australia's new federal ministry was sworn into office with Prime Minister Anthony Albanese appointing a record number of women to a diverse cabinet team that includes religious minorities and indigenous Australians. Nearly 100 people are dead after floods and landslides brought on by non-stop rain wiped out neighbourhoods in the northeastern Brazil. A wildfire has broken out on a hill in Miriang due to dry weather and strong winds. The blaze still hasn't been contained. Authorities raised its wildfire response level to the highest and evacuated hundreds of residents in nearby villages. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with Legoland Resort going full swing with the celebration of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Stay safe and have a good night.